The hardest part about this week's episode was picking just three highlights because today's guest really delivered the goods with a value-packed interview. So here goes. Number one, why if you have to ask yourself if you want to start a business, it's probably not for you. Number two, where the truly great business ideas come from and why many businesses fail. And number three, how to really engage your audience and generate more sales by delivering the right message at the right time and on the right platform. So stay tuned for all of that and so much more on this week's episode of The Truth About Business. I'm Benjamin Brain and by day I'm a director of a multi-award winning family run business. And by night, I interview successful business owners to share their journeys, experiences and truths to serve as inspiration, motivation and first-hand education for like-minded entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to fast-track our own business success. This is the truth about business, told by those who have been there, done that and have the scars to prove it. From the good times to the bad the marketing strategies and sales tactics to the productivity hacks and success habits. I'm here to give you the de-sugar-coated version of what it's really like and what really works. If you're thinking of starting a business or are already in business, I created this for you. So let's get started. In this week's interview, I talk business with Damon Bullimore. Damon's career started when he was taken on by the Royal Mail as a junior programmer while studying for his sandwich degree at Nottingham University. At just 22 years of age, he was responsible for the Royal Mail's first transactional website, which facilitated over £1.2 billion worth of income per year. After Royal Mail was bought out, he got involved with Crowdflow for football clubs and with his partner sat in a back bedroom and developed Scangate, a software that was installed at many of the lower league football teams for monitoring crowds. Following that, Damon sold out an international software business and in the midst of commuting weekly between the UK and South Africa, shortly became managing director of Ashley Adams, a well-known Derbyshire estate agency firm. Now, Damon is a founder and the CEO of BriefYourMarket.com, a fast-growing multi-channel marketing platform that's backed by the likes of Derby County football club owner Mel Morris and was at one point Deloitte's fourth fastest growing technology company in the UK. So to find out more about Damon and the team at Brief Your Market, visit www.briefyourmarket.com or you can find Damon on LinkedIn under Damon Bullimore, spelled B-U-L-L-I-M-O-R-E. In this jam-packed episode, Damon and I cover his own success journey, the lessons he's learned along the way, and some refreshingly honest business home truths. It turned out to be another brilliant interview with a truly inspirational entrepreneur who doesn't believe in it can't be done. You know, success leaves footprints. So let's take a walk with an extremely accomplished businessman and serial entrepreneur, Damon Bullimore. Damon, it's a real honor to have you on the show today. Thank you for taking the time out to share some of your business experiences with us. Thanks, Ben, for having me. And it's fantastic listening to your podcast of the past. So and I hope you uh, do, do a lot more for the future. Thank you. Right. So let's get into the interview. Can you tell us what the speciality of Brief Your Market is? Yeah, I mean, Brief Your Market is a very, very powerful tool if used in the right manner. So it's a multi-channel marketing platform that really at its core epicenters a return on investment for our customers. So what we want to do is show real value for every pound that you spend is you get a return. And we see 20x, 50x, even 1,000x return on investment when used powerfully. And the core of that is sending the right communication at the right time on the right medium. And I think uh, BYM has proven that time and time again, and that is the power of the marketing mix. And if you look at some of the results that come out of Brief Your Market, I mean, we send 13.8 million emails a week. Wow, a week? Uh, A week. Um, You've got to remember there's only around about sub-80 million people inside the United Kingdom. We have 42 million people, unique people, inside our Brief Your Market databases, which is nine terabyte of data. So half of the population, basically. Yeah, that's right. And, and it always blows your mind when you 13.8 million emails a week that you're sending out. And I think when you say that, people might say in exasperation that, wow, that's a lot of spam or a lot of junk. But I think what we focus on is writing the right content on the right medium. And therefore, we have a huge investment, a huge engagement from our customer base. So when we first wrote BYM, 
that we took and what was classed as standard email marketing and the user couldn't preference what they wanted, we changed that and we saw a huge uptake. Other competitors were dealing at 2 and 4% open rate. We can get up to 30 and 50% open rate by, by utilising the right content. And we take that across every single medium out there, so SMS letters, canvas and cards, on market data for a state agency to see how it works. So you've mentioned earlier there one of the things that you guys are really focused on is providing your customers with a big return on investment. What are some of the benefits that companies see from getting this sort of thing right? First benefit is that you're communicating with your customers. And if you're communicating with them the right way, they're going to be super engaged. And therefore, you're going to see being brand dominant in the area or even if you're a national business. So that real rifle shot, that real knowledge of uh, of knowing that you're communicating. And I, and I think extrapolating that out with our automation engine, doing that when your offices are closed or when your business is closed, so you can lie in bed at night and know that, that, that comms are still going out. So you see it on that, that real myopic level of uh, of that level of communication all the way up to understanding what your customers want and when you understand what your customers want you can provide better services and create a much better journey and that's only going to really extrapolate into people being vivacious inside a pub telling people that how amazing you are as a business and that's where that word of mouth grows and you become market dominant and that's some of the benefits that we see from our product. And what's one of the things about all of these types of communications, be it direct mail, email, SMS, that people should know, but you tend to find don't? It's about, for me, the right time on the right level with the right content and being consistent and persistent. I think a lot of people, and we saw it seven, eight, nine years ago when email really started to become dominant as a marketing platform saying, Stop doing letters. You must do email. Well, and the reality is that that's a lack of paradigm of understanding because you're still going to get people that prefer a letter. You're still going to get people that prefer an SMS. You're still going to get people that prefer a, a, an email. People will want to be surveyed. Some people won't. Some people will. And actually creating that marketing mix and, and understanding that with real content at the right time is the most powerful thing. Great advice. Good insights then. And can you tell us the story of a client where you have or where they've taken advantage of your service and they've gone from not using these communications to using the system and really seeing a big difference in their results. Is there anybody that stands out from your past clients or current clients? Um, yeah, I think that there's an enormous amount. Uh, we've got a fantastic amount of testimonials and carry on to get, gather a fantastic amount of testimonials. The one thing, because our whole business is geared on return on investment, we know what we do i I say this all the time if we're not giving a return on investment we don't deserve a seat at the table so great business in derby (laughs) hannels just won the best agency in united kingdom they sound like a great estate agent they're a great great estate agent (laughs) you know and and uh, you and i talking briefly mark it's been a part of that not not all of it not all of it but a part of it and we see that time and time again bradley's down in devon fantastic business we're 22% of their whole website traffic. And see, that's something that I don't think people perhaps link with online communications, with it as in actually driving traffic and potential customers to the website. It's not just reading an email in your inbox and then not doing anything with it. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, I definitely remember being in a demo with Rick Palmer, who's one of the founders of Briefy Market, and we talked to a solicitor, and I won't mention any names, and he says, you know, I've got an award-winning website. And we said, well, if no one goes and has a look, then it's just an award-winning, so it looks nice. But, you know, if you're not getting traffic on there, if you're not driving traffic, then then it's actually not that great. Yeah, you know, driving traffic's really important, and with the advancements of Boost Your Market, not only can we drive traffic, we can actually understand what that traffic is and do something about it to send yet more relevant communication so we know what people are looking at. Sounds really big brothery and really scary, and I'm pretty conscious about that. But it's only there to get a better understanding to give them the right content. Is there a, a, a business, be it one of your own clients or one of the you know the large businesses' names that we all know of, that you think does this communication business really well in terms of finding out what the audience wants, the medium that they want it delivered and when they want it delivered, who would you say for the listeners to, to look at as a great example? Yeah, I mean, I think you're talking about real trailblazers. Um, I think Hannels, again, is a one to definitely look at. They do a really good job. Um, Bradley's down in Devon, who I mentioned, um, 
Paul Wood over at uh, Pygott and Crone in Lincoln. Again, phenomenal. Sheffield University, we're not just in a state agency, so again, phenomenal business, doing lots and lots of traffic. And there's just, for me, I always feel bad saying a subset because there's a huge plethora of customers that I don't deal with personally. These are the people that I deal with personally still. So if you have a look on our website, briefyourmarket.com, then you can get to see all the testimonials and and they're real trailblazers. So obviously we've talked about estate agents, but Brief Your Market provide their services to a whole variety of sectors and industries. Is there one in particular that you see is really making the most of these type of communications? Yeah, I mean, I think if you always look at the real flagship, you've got Amazon.co.uk. You know, they absolutely have nailed user behaviour, people that buy this, like this. And I think that a lot of businesses in other sectors are quite some way behind. But I think we've seen a lot of the high street challenges. The high street challenges are closing because they haven't adopted this method of marketing. Why do you think that is? Why do you think they're slow to pick up on it? I think people perceive it as being tough. You know, when we first wrote Briefy Market, we were in a big educational phase. And, and people always ask me, what's our biggest competitor? And our biggest competitor is always apathy because they believe they don't have to do anything. You know, you, you really have to focus. People find it in the too hard tin. They think it's really tough to do. Uh, and Briefy Market's always been and always will be the product that means you don't have to have 50 marketing executives. You can achieve what 50 marketing executives do by one platform. And that's why we ha- we've always had this sole focus of one platform, multi-channel, do everything in one place and actually really, really smash the communications to customers. And let's say there's somebody that's listening to the podcast right now who is thinking of taking advantage of using these communications. What would be one actionable tip that you could give somebody to go away and implement to slightly enhance their presence on these channels? Start doing it. It's not in the too hard to, and it's like I said before. And I also think as well the biggest tip that I'd give people is when you've realised it's not too hard, you then go from zero to wanting to achieve a million, where what we always appreciate inside business is that it's accretive. So make sure that you pick phase one, then phase two, phase three, and implement phase one, agonise over whether it's right, move on to phase two, do phase two, agonise over phase one and phase two, make sure it's right, go on to phase three. And so it'd be start doing it, put it into small chunks, think about it, uh, and do it really well. So we now know a bit more about your speciality, Damon, and, and what you do here at Briefly Market. I'd now like to find out a bit more about your own journey to, to start in the business. So can you give us a bit of a, a summary of your career leading up to the launch of Briefly Market? Yeah, so I've had a, a really great career, and I've been very, very thankful. So I started my life in Raw Mail, which I absolutely love. I was very, very fortunate to be part of a journey where we wrote some software called ePro that did £1.2 billion worth of income uh, a year. £1.2 billion worth of income? A year, yeah. Wow. Um, And, you know, ePro was also many, many other platforms to allow Raw Mail to diversify into its downstream access service, which was the demonopolisation to allow mail centres to inject mail rather than having to put letters in post boxes. So uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a phenomenal platform. It was a fantastic journey. I was very, very fortunate to work with some absolutely incredible people, be mentored by people at a very, very young age that taught me an enormous amount about business. And the real truth is that I would have never left. But I did leave because we got bought out by a takeover and, and what Raw Mail did really, really well was it encouraged people and developed people it made you feel really special and it invested in you as an individual it wanted you to be the best that you could be and the company that bought it over was all about docking time and and, you know billable time sorry that was the phrase I was looking for and that just wasn't me so it made me then write some software called ScanGate which was the first crowd monitoring software which I wrote with a really clever guy called Mark Arnold and we then bought some IPR front range product called Fraction with some of the clever guys, Mark Duplessis, Stanton Jandrell. Uh, IPR, what's that? Intellectual property. Right, okay. Uh, and a guy called Nigel Basel, which then left me on to lead to buy into an estate agency business with a couple of other clever guys uh, called Rick Palmer and Simon Blunt, uh, which then, just before I bought into that, we wrote Briefly Market for a company up in Edinburgh, both Nigel and I. So the career's been illustrious and it's been a fantastic journey. And I think 
probably the key for me has been throughout that is the people that I've worked with. How did you get your first job? Yeah, so it's interesting for me and the guys of, I was at university doing a sandwich degree and I went on a placement to Royal Mail. We got involved in this concept of EPRO and they uh, paid for me to finish my degree and actually finish the project called EPRO, um, which was revolutionary for them. It was the first ever transactional website Royal Mail had ever done. So it was quite powerful at the time. And you were studying computer science at the University of Nottingham. When did you first realise that you had a passion for these, the coding and the, the technological side of things? I think if I really look back and really think about it, and you, know, you speak to my parents at a very, very young age, uh, what would be like a trivial thing now, because we've all got Sky Q boxes of press and record, you, know, you used to have to you know, change the times and do quite a lot, lot of stuff on uh, VCRs, which probably most listeners won't even understand the, 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 that acronym anymore. Which led me into having like a real obsession. I started writing code with a guy called Paul Groves at a tender age of 13. I just loved it. Everyone always asked me this, the, uh, the guys of saying, should I be a developer? And I think if you ask yourself the question, should you be a developer, you shouldn't be a developer because it's a passion. So that's a question that you already really know the answer to, if it's, if it's the right role for you. Exactly, yeah. And did you always have aspirations of becoming a business owner? did, yeah. I always loved the challenges. I was um, very fortunate. My father had an engineering business with two other guys and seeing the trials and tribulations and growing up and being in the back of a van going down to Cornwall on holiday. My father was delivering punches because the punches seems very physical. They're a metal component. And actually seeing him agonise over his business and agonize over that actually it didn't matter what he'd got to do he, from a family perspective if he could fit in a drop or drop some work on the way down then that would be cool for him and and that makes him sound like he wasn't focused on us as a family he was enormously focused on us as a family but he was always there as an inspiration for you yeah 100 percent. i learned a lot from my father he's a fantastic guy and you do see a lot of or you're very fortunate to be able to see a lot of the trials and tribulations. We know that you were into your coding from a very early age. Were there any signs from those younger days that you would become a business owner? Were there any entrepreneurial traits that you look back at now and think, well, yeah, actually, that's a, a good indication that one day I would go out and start on my own? You know, you always talked about it as an individual, you know, from a very young age. And I'm pretty sure you can ask my parents and my grandfather, who's unfortunately not with, with us anymore, always said to me, uh, which sounds a little bit stupid, in it, and I don't mean it in any other way, but he always said to me, you know, you go really far, you go all the way to the top, then, and you believe in yourself. And, uh, and again, having that family support that drives that belief in you is powerful, really, really powerful. So we know what Briefy Market does with regards to how the system functions and what the results people are looking for are. When you first created the software, how did you realise that there would be a demand for it? You know, the thing for me is that as a developer in the past, you always, and, and sorry, and present and in the future, any developer that sits there and says to you that they've had this light bulb moment and they're writing this software that's going to be revolutionary, they are very few and far between. And actually, that's where, for me, the real risk in software comes. I think agonizing over real business problems gives you the confidence in the software that you're writing to to actually know there's going to be a market. And like I touched on earlier, Briefy Market was spawned out of a business problem that we were involved in at the time. That we went, well, hold on a minute. You know, we then did the research and analysis, looked across the world and said, we could do this much, much better. So that gives you confidence that you've got a market when you've when you've finished. So it's not always about creating something that's revolutionary and new sometimes or a lot of the time. It can just be taking what's already out there and making it better. Yeah, I think whether it's revolutionary or new, whether it's trailblazing or greenfield, I think the key is that you understand the problem you're trying to solve. You know, and whether you want to go all the way over to something that's as out there as Elon Musk, you know, developing electric cars... I still believe his core ethic is he's understanding what the problem is. And he's going, that's a problem, I can do it better. And I think that's where all the real, real great ideas come from. Now, briefly, market, it's sort of got the Ron Seal effect to it. It does what it says on the tin. <laughs> how, how did you come up with the name? What was the, the deciding factor that made you go with that? I think it was three bottles of red wine. Oh, OK. <laughs> so, yeah. 
and there's controversy actually in in the name because some people uh, in our shareholder group like it and some people don't. So Briefy Market, the essence about it was all about we we wanted to help you brief your market. So that's where it came up from. And then, you know, I think we had a list of about 50 names. And it wasn't me that came up with the name. I want to be clear on that. It was a guy called Nigel Basel. And uh, it was the one that we could register and there wasn't on Company's House and et cetera. And we could buy a URL. So, you know, you have all those kind of thoughts as well. How did you find your first paying client once you'd launched full-time as the business? Whenever you're writing uh, software or whenever you're building any business, you always pull on your own network. We got a network of people that we knew. Uh, we understood the problem that we were solving and we went to see friends. And I think that that's really powerful because, first of all, they give you really honest feedback about what's good and what's bad. And I'd do that process again, time in and time out. And you extrapolate the good and you cut out the bad and you keep honing and honing and honing. And, you know, that's how we started building a client bank. And you've obviously been around from the earlier days of particularly on the email marketing side of things. From those initial stages, how did you differentiate yourself from the competition? Was there anything that you consciously set out to do differently or features that you included that nobody else did? Yeah, the preference engine was a big one, but I think also as well the way that we address the market. Now, you know, you can see like a, a MailChimp or a dot mailer that's actually not vertically aligned, and we wanted to be vertically aligned, specialised in our area, understood the problem that estate agencies or insurance brokers or hospitality or financial services, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, were trying to solve and help them. And that's a big thing in Briefing Market, a really big thing. During those first stages of launching, particularly within the first 12 months, what would you say was your biggest challenge? Was the one that sticks out now and how did you overcome it? I think there's always a lot of challenges. <laughs> I think it's hard to say what your biggest one is. I think enveloping people around you is always the challenge. Getting them to believe in the common goal and working hard and tirelessly and being vigorous and dogmatic on that is really, really powerful because... You go through this process of doing all those exercises and building and building and building a, a, a tight team that's focused. And then all of a sudden you go from explaining to them pushing them pushing you along to, to, to go, hold on a minute, we can do this and we can do this and why don't you run faster and run faster, Damon? So uh, the, the biggest challenge in any business is, is having that common goal for me. And that's what we we focus on a lot in so culture is is a big thing for us. Inside. Yeah, so and so rather you having to pull the team along, it's more of they're pushing you along. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think the problem that a lot of people that I see in business have is they believe the business is them, um, and the business wouldn't survive without them. And actually, we always say we're a custodian of the brand. We're only here for a period. We don't know how long that period's going to be. And I think if you look at your business in that way. You don't believe in your own publicity, and we always have a famous saying that we've had for years, which is you don't become a legend in your own lunchtime. You are a custodian, then the people around you believe that they own the business, and I genuinely believe that we have a lot of people in our business that own the business, and that's what we need and want them to be in that mindset. And then it becomes personal, and when it becomes personal, you drive for the stars. How big's the team now? 60 people in Derby. Yeah, it's um, it's a fair few people to rally around. And uh, I remember reading, uh, and very luckily as well, I went on a course for two years, which was done by the London School of Business and Economics, looking at how you grow from 10 people to 20 people, 20 people to 50 people and 50 people and above. And I'll never forget somebody saying to me, growing from 25 people to 50 people is the hardest step. And I completely agree with them now. Why is that? I think when you've got 20 people, you can have that real personal touch and you can go down the pub and have a beer and everyone's honest. And then when you put another layer of management in, you have to work hard that you don't envelop politics and you've got to be clearer and there's got to be clarity and people need to understand what a good day looks like. And you're then now one into 50 rather than one into 20. And you then buy a building that's got two floors instead of one floor and it's them against us. And, you know, there's all those facets that you have to think through. So... We work really hard on that as a business. We do lots of things like we buy everybody lunch every other month and we 
sit in a big room, we do a big presentation, he can ask anything. I have a very open door policy. I make sure I go and see everybody in the business at least once a week. And I'll sit down and talk to him. I'll try and go and take him to the pub and have a beer, which is obviously my favourite place. So we work really hard at that to break barriers down. And that's a big thing for me. So you're at 60 now. What was the point when you realised you needed to bring your first on board? Very early on, the first person that we bought on was a lady called Susanna Mavity, salesperson. There was uh, me, Rick, Nige inside the business at the time. And we just got to a point where, because we'd really agonised on solving the problem, we got to a point where the next thing was, how do we speak to as many people as we could as fast as possible? And there's only so many places you can be in at once, and we needed more resource, so that's what we did. And when you're looking to bring new team members on board now, what are some of the, the skill sets and attitudes and beliefs that you're looking for? Yeah, there's only one thing that I really search for inside somebody, and that's passion. Because, you know, if you've got a passion to be the best developer in the world, you'll be the best developer. And if you've got a passion to be the best salesperson in the world, you'll be the best salesperson. If you've got a passion to be the best marketeer, you'll be the best marketeer. So people who really want to go places and move forward and drive. So it's always attitude over aptitude. That's a really big thing for me. That's a really big thing. Now, you've already mentioned a couple of things with regards to this next question, which is once you get great people on board, how do you retain them? You know, I'm in the offices of Briefy Market now and I see it's nice offices. There's a pool table out to the corner as well. So what are some of the other ways that you keep people here once they're through the door? I want everybody inside the business to believe on the journey that we're, we're on. And I genuinely believe that everyone in our business does believe on that. And you want to be enveloped by the brand, be enveloped by the product. And then, like I said earlier, it becomes personal. You know, I'd be lying if I didn't say we didn't all have dog days. And, you know, we had days that are tough. But we genuinely believe we know where we're going. We work really hard on culture. We work really hard on people. I touched on it a minute ago. You know, we buy everybody lunch. We do something called Food for Thought. We do Star of the Month. We do star of the quarter we actually do we're going to do an awards night at we go a christmas party we go out three times a year because we genuinely believe that if you go out and you have a few beers the barriers drop and you become more open and you become more honest so we strive to be open and honest and i think that goes through everybody inside our business from our chairman mel morris all the way through the business we're always open and honest and you can ask us anything at any stage now which parts of the business do you personally enjoy the most if you could spend all day doing something and i think i know the answer to this well what would it be yeah definitely definitely development i mean you know do have a real passion for it absolutely love it and it is yeah by my far you know everyone in the business knows it's my favorite area so i'm really honest about it in our own business um, yeah, it's by far my favourite. But Which parts do you not necessarily enjoy? That is quite a tough question because I actually still go out and I still sell and I still demo. I still try and get involved in marketing and I love the UI, UX side of the software and love the architecture side of the software. So I can't think of anything inside our business. I mean, I'm, I literally have done every single job inside Briefy Market over the years. Probably the only one I'm not great at that I don't like is documenting hr stuff if that was the if that was the one i could never ever deal with ever again yeah. then i think that would be the one but apart from that you know i really enjoy every challenger every part of the business now we've already talked about your illustrious career so far some real highlights from you know from a very early age if you could pick one bit at briefy market or outside of briefy market what would you say has been your your either your biggest success or your proudest moment so far um, so probably the proudest moment would be marrying my wife and having two kids. <laughs> Good answer. Good <laughs> so, answer. Uh, just in case she's listening. <laughs> uh, so they by far are my proudest moments. I don't know. I, I've actually thoroughly enjoyed every stage of every part of every business that I've been involved in. Probably the thing that, that's really powerful for me is the people that I've worked with. And, you know, I've been so fortunate to work with some absolutely incredible people. I'm not sure if I've got a proudest moment. I've got a million fond memories and a billion, million bad memories as well. So, but, you know, a real highlight for me is being able to work with, with the people I work with. So, you know, you've got the likes of Mel Morris at the moment, uh, or work with, he's my chairman, or Rick Palmer, who's one of our nerds, and David Nunes, who's one of our nerds. 
uh, and a fantastic bunch of people in cyber if you market every one of them i'd love to name but you pretty you get bored pretty quickly that's a great answer nice it's a great answer and you can tell when somebody is being honest with that so briefly market you, you've been in operation for 10 years now there's been lots of lessons over the years i'm sure as we'll probably get into in, in a few moments but if you could go back to day one and you could do one thing differently what would it be if i could change one thing and that would be giving myself more confidence so what might seem quite bizarre is i'm actually quite low in confidence as the you know being this kind of skill set that i have you're naturally an introvert and you're naturally low in confidence and I think when that is a powerful thing, but it's also a negative thing because you believe everyone in the room is better than you are and you devalue your own skill set. And I think I've suffered with that in the last 10 years. I've got much, much better in the last five years. Uh, and that's, again, is thanks to Mel, Rick and David, you know, supporting me and, and making me, me a better person. And I think that's common among, if not all, most business owners is that sort of imposter syndrome so you've said that over the last five years that's something that you have managed to deal with far better what what are some of the ways that you do deal with that so for anybody out there now that's feeling the same way what would you suggest what were the takeaways from your own lessons on that i think again surrounding yourself with people that have actually been through the journey that you're going through and realizing that it's not unique to you it's normal well business is hard there's an enormous amount of sacrifice and an enormous amount of uh, bloody hard work. So I think, again, it, you know, it, it's, it's enveloping yourself with uh, uh, people and, and, and pushing yourself hard and, uh, and opening the too hard to do list. That's big. That's really big. Now, brief your market right now. Obviously, you're working with literally thousands of businesses. Yeah. You're across multiple sectors. Mm -hmm. You're regularly releasing new updates and, and new additions to the software that you provide. What does the future look like for Briefy Market? Where are you hoping to take it? A super exciting place to be at the minute, and we're very, very thankful. And like I say, it's been 10 years of hard work getting where we are. So, you know, there, there's loads of opportunities for Briefy Market. Do we open more verticals? Do we go cross-continent? Do we? How do we go cross-continent? What do we look at? Uh, do we build by partner more software? So, uh, you know, the future's great for BYM. It's a, it's a great place to be. It's a great place to work. And I'm really optimistic and focused on where we're going to be in the next 18 months, 24 months, 36 months. And what about yourself, Damon? Have you got any sort of personal ambitions, big, hairy, audacious goals that you're working towards? <laughs> I've got one aspiration and goal that's personal, which I've always said that uh, me and my wife have been together since I was 13. I'm 42 now. Wow, congratulations. That's a big achievement in itself. So. Yeah, thank you. And I've always said I want to share a bag of chips with her somewhere when I'm 65 years of age. That's a really big area oh, goal that I want to achieve. Okay, uh, you've still got a few years to go on that one then. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> um, I think for me, family's really important. I've got some real core morals and ethics around that. And, uh, you know, my wife's a big strength for me, although I don't like to tell her too much. Um <laughs> So the secret's yeah. out now. <laughs> yeah. So my real big aspiration is that we stay together because although I find the journey tough, I'm sure she finds it 10x harder than I do because she just gets me when I'm in a bad mood or I've had a bad day and I'm probably grumpy and et cetera, et cetera. So that's my really big ask, goal that I want to make sure I No, it's, it's a good one to have, definitely. So we know about you and the guys at Briefy Market, what your speciality is. We know a bit more about your own journey, Damon. Now I'd like to find out a bit more about Damon, the entrepreneur slash businessman. So can you tell us what a typical day in the life of Damon looks like? I tend to work pretty long hours. I tend to get up anywhere between 5 and 5.30. Try and play squash a couple of times a week uh, on the squash court at quarter seven. And from a personal perspective, try and then run three times a week and go to the gym three times a week with my son. So I think what's really important as well is keeping that level of fitness to keep you that level of focus. Because when you feel strong, you feel good. And then when I'm not doing sport, uh, which sounds like I do a lot, which is not that much, I'm here working hard. So, you know, that can be actually anything from sitting here and having personal time with a PC, writing whatever we're doing, or actually being out on the road demoing the software or in a user group or with partners or trying to recruit fantastic people and, and all that plethora and 
and and really keeping an eye on things. Now, do you have any sort of staple morning routines or, or daily habits that you are sort of religious to and you feel have contributed towards your success? Is there anything that you you do on it on a regular basis? So there's a couple of things that I'm really religious about and I, and I have let go a couple of times and have had a challenge to my mental state. And I don't mean I've had a mental breakdown, but you just start to feel so empty and so low and you feel like, you know, if you've got to put petrol in your car, everything's a challenge. So I, I really try and stay fit and that's been a that's been a big thing for me. And then no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I am, I always want to get back at 6.30 and have tea, sit around the table with my wife and children. And I say the children, they're 20 and 17. Because that's the staple, that that's the home farm that, that gives me support. I can't always do that because sometimes I work away. And then I'm happy to work again later in the night. Uh, but they're the things that I'm really keen on. And you mentioned a few moments ago at, at getting up at 5, 5.30 every morning. Is that something that you have to try to do do you have any sort of alarms or rituals or is that something that just comes naturally to you now no it's a real curse unfortunately it's natural (laughs) so i'd love to turn it off to be honest it's just that routine that you get into and you know for me it's nice to be able to have some personal time so i'll do some reading or i'll do some work or i might just sit with a dog and ponder and wait for the rest of the world to get up what would you say has been your your toughest or most difficult decision to make in business probably the toughest decision i've ever had to make is over where businesses have started to go wrong and you've got to make life-changing decisions for other people and that weighs really heavy and i've only had to do it a couple of times and it's always been as an effect of the micro and macro market but that is horrible and you want you know you lie in bed at night and you don't sleep you agonize you sweat in your thinking your you you challenge yourself on what you should have done different and how you should have behaved different and why it got to that stage and it's horrible and i think what's worse is when you have to deliver that level of news that they think you're a fat cat sat there creaming all the money and you're throwing loads of money in the business so that's the toughest thing what do you think your own personal strengths are? What are some of your own attributes that you feel have contributed to your success in, in your own career and the success of Briefy Market? So there's one thing that I think everyone around me would say is, and, uh, and it's interesting, my son asked me many, many years ago when he was younger, Daddy, what do you do for a living? And I said to him, I delete a T and I turn a can from a can. So I'm very, very focused on anything what i'm focused on i'm 100 percent focused on and i never ever stop until we achieve it i don't believe in people that tell me we can't do it people say that just drives me harder to do it so i think that's been a real core element and you know if you're inside briefy market you'd hear me say a lot of the time like come on let's just focus and get it done and you know we work hard and and we always achieve so that's one aspect and i think the second aspect is that I absolutely love people and we love people in the guise of developing people, working with the best of the best, creating an environment where they can become the best that they can be and there's nothing more beautiful and there's loads of examples inside every business that I've ever been in where we've taken people that have come in at apprenticeship level and they've worked all the way up to director level over a period of time and that's been about them wanting to be the best that they can be and us giving them the opportunity to do that. And for those people who are thinking of starting a business, what are some of the things that you think that they should know, but you tend to find people don't? Well, if you think that you're going to start a business and you're going to work three hours a day and drive a Ferrari, then don't do it. And I think also as well, again, if you're asking yourself the question, if you want to start a business, don't do it, because I do genuinely believe it's in your DNA. And you've got that drive and hunger and you want to do it. If anyone's sitting there thinking it's easy, it's not. It's really, really hard. And don't look around you and and think that everyone's got it nailed and they're all sitting there, you know, smoking cigars. It, it, it's it, There's loads of challenges. And, you know, we, it's those three o'clock in the mornings when you wake up with those cold sweats, when you're doubting yourself, when you know you've got 60 people that you've got to feed or 100 people that you've got to feed. It's those times where you need real resolve. If you're asking yourself, don't do it. 
What are some of the sacrifices you've had to make, Damon, to, to get to where you are now? It's probably a bit of a too long a list to write down. So, you know, if you looked at Briefy Market from outside, you'd think that, you know, I was working two hours a, a day and, uh, you know, two days a week, and that's not the reality. You know, just gone through a period where we've been writing a product called Build Your Market. We've been working 20-hour days, seven days a week, and continually to working really, really hard. So, you know, if I take myself back to my earlier career, I didn't even see my own daughter for the first year. I've worked away a lot. Uh, and I think the biggest sacrifice for me has been kind of those dark days when you say to your wife, oh, by the way, I need to put more money into the company. And she turns around and goes, oh, you're really doing the right thing. And, you know, you believe it, but but they're one step removed. So sacrifice has been enormous. But what would you say has been your, your worst entrepreneurial moment so far? Oh, I think there's been thousands. <laughs> <laughs> I think any entrepreneur that sits there and says that they can get it done in day one just talks a load of rubbish. I think if you look at anybody that runs a business, there's always 50 failures behind them for the one that they've succeeded. And I think what you've got to remember, and it's that resolve I talked about a minute ago, which is you've got to fail to succeed. But you've also got to be balanced in having that raw honesty with yourself that says enough is enough and actually I am flogging a dead horse. And that's a real fine balance because I see a lot of coaches that sit there and say, you know, the differences between failure and success is you get up and have another go. But uh, sometimes enough is enough. And do you think that's just a feeling deep down in your gut or are there some indicators that you can use to help you work out whether it is one that you should just get up and have another go at or whether you should pivot and, and put your focus somewhere else i think if you think that you've just got that as an individual then you know you do have like a gut feeling i'm not saying that but i think that's the time where good people come in because sitting down with five people and and really agonizing over it and you know seeing the different emotions in each individual person is the key you know i always go back to i'm not a person that sits in a room and says i know the answer and in an individual I, i like to be collaborative What's the best advice you've ever received? Analyse everybody around you. Pick the three things that you love about what they do and adopt them and pick the three things that you hate about what they do and make sure you don't repeat them. And it, again, it always makes me think about people and, and, and actually the people I'm working with and also then makes me think about me as an individual and how can I be better. Who gave you that advice? There's a guy called Bob Waters in Royal Mail who I've got, unfortunately, he's not on this planet anymore, an enormous, or had an enormous amount of time for. And you still remember that lesson, was it 20 years on now from when you were working at Royal Mail? It will be 20 years, yeah. And if you could visit your 21-year-old self and give 21-year-old Damon one piece of advice, would it be the same advice or would it be something different? Yeah, I think I'd definitely give myself that piece of advice. Also something that my father always said to me, which is learn like you're going to live forever and live like you're going to die tomorrow. You know, they're core staples that, 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 that I've adopted and, and learned from. What, what, does that, what does that phrase mean to you? I think it's realising that you have to, you're never completed. And I think understanding that you're never completed, understanding that you've got more to learn, means that you don't become a megalomaniac and you don't become too arrogant. And I think it's, it's harder as you go up inside a business because you you get less and less that you can learn or you have a perception that there's less and less that you can learn which is an absolute load of rubbish you can learn from everybody uh, but you've got to have your eyes open and be open to learning and i don't just mean about learning from a textbook i'm talking about soft skills or or presentation or whatever it is and uh, and so that means a lot to me do you read damon Yes, unfortunately, an enormous amount. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So if, if you could pick one business book to recommend to the listeners, which one would it be? Do you know what? I've got so many. I couldn't just pick one because actually there's so many different books that I've read that have given me different messages. So, you know, if I was thinking about people and culture, you've got Seven Highly Effective Habits um, from Stephen Covey, which is a very popular book. What was your main takeaway from that one then? So it, I think it was all about understanding people. And again, you know, it made me think about people in a different way. And also where you find somebody that you thought were belligerent, you realise that from the book that they were just coming at it from a different angle. Uh, and therefore, when you started to really consume that data in your mind, 
not only could you be better, they could be better, and all of a sudden you were unified. So that was a you know hugely powerful book for me, hugely powerful book that I thoroughly enjoyed. You know, Simon Sneak, again, loads of powerful books, start with the reason why. I can go on, co-complete from a development perspective, understanding the three types of developers, you know, beach stormers, beach invaders, and then uh, accretive changes. Uh, again, was a really powerful book. Agile development, really, I, I, I can't just give you one, sorry. Well, you've, got, you've given some great recommendations there, so thank you for that. But I know that for a lot of people that I speak to, they'd love to be able to read more, but they just don't manage to schedule it into their time. How do you, is it part of your daily routine or do you just get it in when you've got some free time or, or how do you go about your learning because obviously you are an, an avid reader so it's quite simple for me i think it's uh, again you know going back to that that phrase that i said which is uh, learn like you're going to live forever I, I, I just don't buy that you can't schedule it in I, sorry I just think it feels like it's an excuse and i think if it matters to you and you're passionate about being the best you can be you find the time so you know I have a Kindle. I get in bed at night and I read. And if I if I'm going on a train and I'm I want to spend some time working, and then I might spend some time reading, or I just make sure I read because I enjoy it. And if you could write a book, or if you had to write a book about your own journey in business so far, what would you call it? I'm going to paraphrase something that Rick Palmer, who's my business partner in Briefy Market, and also my business or was my business partner in Ash Adams when we used to own it. And that is, he said to me, Damon, I'm going to promise you one thing. He says, the highest of highs, the lowest of lows, and absolutely in between. Nice. So um, I think that would be the phrase I'd call the book. Okay, yeah, love it. Can you tell us a bit more of why you picked that? Yeah, I think it really resembles the journey. You know, you do have the highest of highs. You have purple patches inside businesses where no matter what you do, you just everything just seems to go well. And then you have the real demonic, dirty, dark days, which is the lowest of lows. And you never seem to have just that consistent period where just everything's normal. So, yeah, I think it would be a good representation of my journey as a as a human being in, in business. Yeah, brilliant answer. It's definitely one that I'd be putting in the shopping basket if I saw it on Amazon. <laughs> so I like that title. It's a good one. Who has been your biggest inspiration so far? Has there been anybody that you've looked up to in the past or, or you look up to at the moment? Again, you know, it's hard to actually just give one individual. So, you know, I go into my earlier career, Bob Waters, Paul Straker, David Mawson, Neil Fleming-Smith, great guys who I work with, Mark Arnold, phenomenal developer, Nigel Bars was a guy I work with now, every single person in Cyber Reef Market I absolutely adore working with. Um, I think a set of guys that really stand out for me are my board. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very, very fortunate to be able to work with Mel Morris, an absolute genius. And and I don't just mean that from intellectual genius, I mean that from human soft skills. Uh, really understanding it, he's seen more and done more than, I think, in a week than I've done in my life. And he's phenomenal. And, you know, you've got Rick Palmer that's the same and David Nunes is the same. So I don't know if your listeners will know who, well, I'm pretty sure they'll know who Mel Morris is because obviously he wrote Candy Crush and owns Derby County Football Club. Um, but he's got such an illustrious career before that. David Nunes owns LSL, which is Your Move, Reads, Reigns. I think in the heyday they employed 5,000 people. Yeah, big estate agency group. Yeah, and Rick Palmer founded Morgs of Icebury that, that floated and on the stock for around about 350 million. So... And also did a plethora of other businesses, same as David and same as Mel. So when you've got that welfare experience around you, um, you know, you can't you can't ignore that. It's phenomenal. And then I think that, you know, that's in your circle. And then, you know, you can't forget the people like Elon Musk, Einstein, the cliche ones that, that are phenomenal. And for the, for the people that don't have those type of leaders and, and mentors directly in their circle now, but appreciate the value of being able to communicate and mix with these people. How do you find the circles? How do you find these people who are going to push you to come outside of your comfort zone and grow? I think that, you know, the first thing you need is a lot of luck. You know, I've been very fortunate to cross paths with a lot of phenomenal people. But I think also, you know, looking at it from the different angle for me, you can see something in individuals, you know, that that attracts yourself to other individuals that you kind of want to help. 
So I think there's two things. I think there's I've been very, very fortunate for be able to for my past to cross them. But I think I've also been open and determined and dogmatic on wanting to a to really exasperate those. And I think if I put myself in their shoes, and this is not me blowing smoke at my bottom, by the way, that they <laughs> they they would have seen that and gone, well, this is a guy that wants to learn. And and you know that, Ben, if you come across somebody, that, that is the most engaging thing that you can ever consume. Yeah, successful people want to help out other people that want to be successful. 100%, 100%. So yeah. a lot of the time it is just asking. Yeah, yeah, definitely just asking, putting yourself out there, not being too belligerent or t- too pushy or and i think if you come across it as in you're a megalomaniac yourself and trying to approach in that way they're never going to engage mm. uh, where if you go and say look I, I just like some help the amount of successful people that i have met always want to help you and we've talked about some advice that your father passed down to you which was learn like you or live forever but live like you will Die. die tomorrow exactly do you have any other favorite quotes that you try to live by or that you keep close by i think it all depends on kind of what situation that you're in you know you've got the famous quote which is action about action and vision so and i've not heard that one have you not yeah so, tell, tell us a bit more so about that one uh, with only vision you get emptiness with only action and no vision you get short-mindedness with action and vision you can change the world wow that's um, powerful yeah so uh, there's loads of phrases that you you know you live with and you learn by and uh, again i couldn't just say one you know that the, the that famous einstein quote that that's on mel morris's office always blows me away that says you know data's powerful but what happens if you invoke imagination and if you could recommend one resource for a listener to better their life in any way, be it personal habits or business, which one would it be? The one thing that I would always say is the big big thing is be open-minded and listen. Because when you're open-minded and listen and you truly listen, you learn so much more than you ever think you could learn. Well, we're coming to the end of the interview now, Damon. It's been a fascinating hour. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking business with you. And thank you for being so open and honest. You've shared some great insights and I've, I've definitely learned an awful lot myself. So two more questions. The first one being, if we could summarize everything that we've talked about this afternoon and you were sat in front of somebody who's about to start in business right now and you could give them three pointers to help them succeed, what would you say? Probably the three cliche ones would be work hard, work hard and work hard. Although that's probably not what you were looking for. So. No, it's whatever's been your truth. So it's a, it's a great answer if that's the case. Yeah, so so yeah, I'll probably just, I'll just elaborate on that, that in a slight way in saying, you know, definitely work hard, definitely be focused, be dogmatic, be vigorous. Absolutely agonise over the business problem that you're trying to solve. Make sure that you do solve it. Make sure if there's something in the too hard tin that you, you open it and you, you you work on it. And then the third thing for me would be don't forget about you. And actually, you know, you can get so focused on satisfying the business. And somebody once said to me, again, this is the famous Mel Morris said to me, but what value do you get from the business? As in you as a human. And thinking about that, because if you can understand that and you can harness that, you're just a 100x better. And finally, Damon, if the listeners want to find out more about you or Briefy Market, whereabouts can we find you online? Yeah, so www.briefymarket.com. Me personally, I'm on linkedin.com, which seems to be the business platform. And, uh, you know, if anyone wants to reach out, then you'll have my details, Ben, if, you know, you want to pass them on, if they if that's how they communicate. Yeah, absolutely. Any resources or books or links that we've talked about now that we've shared in the interview, you can find all of them at the show notes, which is at www.benjaminbrain.com forward slash Damon dash Bullymore. So all of those links will be included there for anybody that wants to find out more, most definitely. Yeah, that's brilliant, Ben. Yeah, thank you. Just before we wrap up, I just want to say a massive thank you to you. You put an enormous amount of hard work into all the questions that I think are adding huge value to other people. And I think rather than it me sharing my experiences, uh, you creating the right set of questions in the right dynamic format has been very powerful. So thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Damon. It, uh, it means a lot. I wasn't expecting that. You caught me off guard there. Yeah, no. But no, thank you. I, I'm, I'm just hope that, you know, well, I know that, you know, you guys being so open and honest and sharing your own journeys, it, it must be so helpful to people who are about to embark on that journey or are in it themselves. So hopefully we're, we're helping people out there. So that's what I'd like to think is happening. But thank you again for, 
for taking the time out. I know you're you're a, you're a busy man. You've got lots going on. So the fact that you're prepared to share your time with me and and share your journey with the audience it means an awful lot. So thank you so much for for joining us on the yeah. show today. Thank you, mate. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So it's been another great episode with Damon Bullymore of Briefly Market. Some amazing business insights, real golden nuggets of wisdom in there. Thank you to all of the listeners for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have recording it. And I'll catch up with you on next week's episode of The Truth About Business. One final thing before you go, if you enjoyed this interview and want to make sure you don't miss out on the next episode with another real life business champion, make sure you subscribe via iTunes, Spotify, your favorite podcast app, or by visiting my blog at benjaminbrain.co.uk and hitting subscribe. At the blog, you'll also find the show notes to this episode, which includes all the relevant links to the website, social media channels, contact details, and anything else that was discussed in the episode. Just type in the name of the guest and that will bring that right up for you. And finally, I'm always on the search for great business owners who would be happy to spare just a couple of hours of the time to share their business experience with our audience. So if you know of anyone that would make a great guest or you'd like to feature yourself, just let me know. Send an email to hello at benjaminbrain.co.uk and I'll reply personally as soon as possible. Also, if you've got any feedback, questions that you'd like me to ask our guests or any other suggestions, I am definitely all ears. That email address again is hello at benjaminbrain.co.uk. So that's it for this episode. I just want to thank you sincerely for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay hungry, stay fearless, get out there and make it happen.